Chapter 2.2, we're going to be working a little bit with more graphs and displays. So we've already done the frequency histogram in the last section. Uh, so now we're going to work with a couple more. We'll start with stem and leaf plots. I'm sure most of us have seen these types of graphs um, before. Uh, but starting with stem and leaf plots here. So for a stem and leaf plot, the data is separated into two different columns. The first one is the stem, second one is the leaf. The stem is going to be the entries uh, or the entries digits left of the rightmost digit. And the leaf is the entries rightmost digit. So these are similar to a histogram, which it may not look like it at first, but they're similar to a histogram except these stem and leaf plots actually have the original data still in them and there's no bars that are being drawn necessarily. And for the third thing here, they should contain some sort of key just to help us read it. So let's look at this example. So this is what a stem and leaf plot can look like. We have the stems on the left, the leaves on the right, and we have the key down there to help us read it. So the, all of the leaves here, the leaves, the rightmost column, are going to be the entries rightmost digit, and the stem are going to be the digits to the left of the rightmost digit. So we can see what that means with the key. A value of 10 and then the bar and 2 represents 102. Okay, so for this first for this first row here, the stem of 2 and the leaves of two, uh, 0, 3 and 5, well, that would represent 20, 23 and 25. So let's answer the questions based on the stem and leaf plot. Actually, before we answer these questions, the reason why it kind of can resemble a histogram, if you turn your head to the right, I can't flip it on my screen, if you turn your head to the right 90 degrees, you can kind of see how it's in order from top to bottom in terms of smallest value to largest value. And the numbers for the leaves are kind of resembling the bars of a histogram. So you can see where most of the data might lie. Okay, for the first question here, uh, what is the shortest baseball throw? So these are in order. So the shortest baseball throw is just going to be 20. Just the topmost one and the leftmost leaf. We want to know how many baseball throws were under 40 feet. So 40 feet is going to be right here all we have to do is count how many baseball throws were under that one so that's going to be one two three four five and six so six baseball throws were under 40 feet okay, let's do another one so the next stem and leaf plot we have is race running times in seconds so we have once again they're in order from top to bottom and we have the key so for this first for this first row, a stem of 12 and leaves of 2 and 6 represent 122 and 126 seconds. And the key tells us that, oh, sorry, oh, I was actually wrong. It's 12.2 and 12.6 seconds. So that's why it's important to look at the key because that was actually, it represents a decimal this time rather than just whole numbers. Okay, so let's answer these questions. So what is the longest race running time? So they're in order, so that's gonna be the last one. That's gonna be right down here. So that's going to be 18.3 seconds. So that means that person's who came in that, who took that long, they came in last place. And assuming that all of these represent every single race runner in that race, we want to know what's the winning time. So the winning time is going to be the shortest time, which is going to be up here, which is going to represent 12.2 seconds. And for the last one, how many race times are longer than 16.1 seconds? So 16.1 is right here. And we want to know how many are longer than it. So that's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 
So that's going to be 9. So whoever had the race time of 16.1 seconds beat 9 other people. And let's create our own stem and leaf plot now instead of using one that was already made for us. Okay, so what I like to do here, what I think is the easiest, so we have this data. What I think is easiest is to find the smallest value and the largest value. So the smallest value looks like it's 89. And the largest value is 159. The reason why I like doing it this way is because now we can start setting up the stem. We know 89 is the smallest, so that's going to be the stem. I'm going to create all of the stems now up to 15. So 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Because we know that 15 is the highest one. So even if one one of those stems was not being used, we should actually still include it in there. Okay, so now let's fill in the leaves. So 89 is going to be the first one. I'm going to cross them out as I go. And then let's look for 9. So uh, look for numbers in the 90s. So we have 91, and that looks like it. And now for the 10, that means we're going to look for numbers from 100 to 109. So we have a 105, a 107, and a 108. So 5, 7, 8. For the 11, that means we're looking for numbers from 110 to 119. And it looks like we're going to have 112. 114, 116, 118. So 2, 4, 6, 8. And for the 12, that's going to be um, numbers between 120 and 129. So 122, 126, 126, 129. So 2, six, six, and nine, and I'm just gonna fill in the rest of them. For 13, we should be getting 130, 132, 137, 138, 139, and 142, 144, 145, 148. For 15 is 155 and 159. So that would be our stem and leaf plot. I'm gonna put a key just so if we were showing this to somebody else at a presentation or something, they know what it represents. So the key here, I'm gonna say 15 for the stem and nine for the leaf refers to a value of 159. Okay, so that's our stem and leaf plot. Okay, next one for uh, for this is going to be a pie chart. So I'm sure most of us are familiar with pie charts. They're pretty simple to read. We're going to make one, which making it by hand is a little bit more to it. So for pie charts, they're used to represent data as percentages. And remember from the last section that percentages, uh, we get percentages from the relative frequency for each one of those classes. And the key thing here is if we're doing this by hand, we have to calculate the angles, which are called central angles, if you remember back to maybe a geometry class, we have to calculate the central angles to create accurate slices for each one of those slices in the pie. So here's how we do that. We do it by doing central angle equals 360 degrees times the relative frequency. So the reason why we use 360 degrees is because there's 360 degrees in a circle when you go around a circle, that's 360 degrees. So we're saying essentially what percentage of that 360 degrees will be the central angle. And central angles are angles coming off the center of the circle. Okay, so let's see an example here just so we can see what we're going to be doing uh, when we're creating this. So this, let's say we have a table that is the favorite type of movie. We have comedy, action, romance, drama, and sci-fi. And then we have the total number of people 
that voted for each favorite type of movie. Four for comedy, five for action, six for romance, one for drama, four for sci-fi. So this is what a, um, a pie chart would look like for this data. So you can see by looking at the table that romance has the most out of any of them. So that one has the largest slice in the pie, so that makes sense. It's the red one. We also have the percentages here. So let's say for comedy, let's say we wanted to calculate the relative frequency. So the relative frequency for comedy would be F over N. The frequency for comedy was 4. The total number of data entries here is going to be 20. If we added up all these values, we'd get 20. So 4 out of 20. This gives us 0.2, which is 20%. So that's why it has... 20% here it comes from the relative frequency of 0.2. And the last thing I'll mention for this, this angle right here, as well as all of the other angles like this for each one, this is a central angle. So we're, we are going to be calculating that central central angle for each slice in the next example. Okay, so let's fill in an example for a pie chart. So let's create one uh, by first finding the relative frequency and central angle for each degree earned. So once again, typically this is something that we wouldn't be doing by hand. We would uh, use different software. Uh, Microsoft Word has one that's pretty um, easy to use and gives you a, decently, a decent pie chart from it. Um, but we're just going to do it by hand to make sure we know how to do it. So this table that we have here are the different types of degrees that were earned in 2011. So we have associates, bachelors, masters, and doctoral. We have the frequency, which is in thousands, which we're kind of going to ignore when we're doing the calculations. So 942,000 degrees earned in 2011 were associates. 1,716,000 were bachelors and so on. We're going to calculate the relative frequency and the central angle for each one of these. So let's do the relative frequency first here. So I'm going to draw it down here for us. So associates. So the relative frequency is going to be, I'm going to abbreviate, it's F over N. So the F is the frequency for associates, which is 942. So we're not directly given the N. We have to figure it out by adding up all of these frequencies. So the, the total number of data entries is going to be the summation of these frequencies. If we added these up, we would get 3,553. So that's going to be the denominator. We divide those, we would get 0.265. So that's the relative frequency for associates. And let's do the central angle. The central angle, which is going to help us draw a decently accurate slice in the pie, is 360 degrees times that relative frequency of 0.265. If we multiplied those, we would get about 95 degrees. So I am rounding these angles here just so we don't have to deal with uh, decimal angles. So that is the angle. So essentially we just said that 26.5% of 360 degrees is about 95 degrees. So for the next one for the bachelors, I'll do this one and then I'll fill in the other ones just so we don't have to wait for me to fill in the other ones. So for bachelors, the relative frequency is going to be F over N. That's going to be 1,716 over 3,553, which is going to give us 0.483. And the central angle 
is going to be 360 degrees times the relative frequency of 0.483, which gives us 174 degrees. So I'm going to fill that in for bachelors. So if we went through and we did, we did the same thing for masters and doctoral, we would end up getting for masters a relative frequency of 0 0.206 and a central angle of 74 degrees. For doctoral relative frequency, we would get 0 0.046 with a central angle of 17 degrees. So let's go down and fill in this. We're going to fill in this little pie chart right here. So I'm going to have a central angle right here. Oops. So I'm just going to let this be the center of the circle. And we're going to create our pie slices from here. So it doesn't matter where you start or which one you do first or anything. I'm just going to start with associates because it's first. So we want a central angle of 95 degrees. So I'm not using a protractor here or anything. I'm just going to kind of eyeball it. So 95 degrees is going to be about, I'm just going to draw the first line just right here. It doesn't matter. 95 degrees is a little bit more than a right angle. So something like that, where this is 95 degrees right there. And this represents the associates. Associate associates degree. And this was 26.5% of the data. Okay, next one was bachelor's. So bachelor's was 174 degrees. So 174 degrees, I'm just gonna use one of these to help. That's a little bit less than 180 degrees, which would be a straight angle. So I'm going to say this right here is 174 degrees. And this is going to represent the bachelors, which was 48.3% from the relative frequency. So 48.3% of degrees earned were bachelors. Next, I'll do masters. Masters was 74 degrees. 74 degrees might be something like, oops. Something like this, where this is the angle. And this little slice represents master's degree and that was 20.6%. And lastly, for doctoral, that's gonna be this small slice right here. That was, what was that one, 17 degrees. Let's see if I can fit that in here. That's 17 degrees, and that is doctoral, which I'm going to write sideways to make it fit. And that was, 4.6%. Okay, so obviously not the best looking pie chart you've ever seen in your life, but that's how you would do these by hand. If you wanted to be perfectly accurate, you could use a protractor. Okay, for the last thing, which we're not going to get into too much because this is actually another topic that we may or may not get to later on, uh, there's scatter plots. So when each entry in one data set corresponds to another data entry in a second data set, what we could get is an ordered pair, which we can plot on a set of x, y axes. So we'll see an example in a second. There's going to be a couple types of correlation, a couple types of main correlation anyway, that we can get from this. Uh, we can have positive, negative, or no correlation. Positive correlation is when x increases. So when one of the data entries increases, we notice that the other one also increases. So for example, this would look something like, if this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, it would look something like this, 
where it's rising left to right if you plotted the points. Negative correlation is when x increases. We see that y decreases. And for this one, it would look something like this on the x, y axes, where it would be falling from left to right if you plotted the points. No correlation is just when there would be neither positive nor negative correlation exists. So it appears to be random. So it would be something like this. Not the only type of no correlation, but obviously this one's pretty obvious. It's just all over the place, pretty scattered. Okay, so here's an example. If we have the hours studied and we compare that to the grade that they got on a test. So the hours studied here is the x-axis. If we have time, time is typically the x-axis. So hours studied is the x-axis, so we go from zero to eight hours. And the grade on the test, we go from 40% to 90%, or 40% to 100%, the 100's not labeled, for the grade on the test. So we can see that, in general, the more that the person studied, the better they did on the test. So like if we looked at the this dot right here, that data entry, it looks like this person studied for around six hours and they got almost a 70% on the exam. For this one right here, they studied for two hours and got about a 50%. So in general, the more you study, it looks like the better test grade you're gonna get. So as one increases, the other one also increases. So that means we see a positive correlation here. So some, something important to take note of, I'm sure most of you have heard this phrase, correlation does not imply causation. So just because you studied more does not necessarily mean that it caused you to get a better test grade. Although for this particular case, I think it's pretty safe to say that in general, the more you study, the better you are gonna do. But in general though, correlation does not imply causation. Just because there is correlation doesn't mean one caused the other one to happen necessarily. Okay, so this is actually all for chapter 2.2.